Hey there, everybody. We're going to get started. Hopefully you can all hear me now that we've started. I have muted everyone's lines, so you won't be able to speak to one another, but if you would like to contribute to the webinar, ask questions, or if you have technical difficulties, make sure you type that into the chat box. So my name is Leah Green. I work for the Resource Sharing Project under our Rural Grant. I'm the Rural Technical Assistance Specialist. So I get to do the exciting job of meeting and talking with rural advocates all over the country, which I really love to do. Rural work is just so unique and interesting, and I get to meet so many wonderful advocates. Um, you are all some of the most creative advocates, honestly, that you know anyone could ever really meet. So I really love getting to do that. Today we're going to be talking about volunteer engagement. So let's get started. So um, for audio, it's best if you call in on our phone line. If you have any technical difficulties and you're listening on your computer, it's going to be the first thing we're going to tell you to do. Um, the number is on the screen right now. And if you have any technical difficulties with iLink as a program, please contact them. They're very speedy at getting um, your problem fixed. So just dial 1-800-799-4510. One zero. And for those of you that might be new to iLink, we're just going to do a little tour real quick. So in the upper left-hand corner, you should see a picture of my smiling face. And below that, you'll see all the other participants that are on the webinar with us today. Um, below that is the feedback bar. So why don't we just test that out right now. And click yes or no. So click yes if you can see the feedback bar. Awesome. So it looks like most of you found that. So we will just clear that. And below that, you'll see the chat box. We've already been having a bit of a conversation in there. We really like to keep our chat box lively. Um, we like to answer questions kind of as they come throughout the webinar. So please don't hesitate to um, ask your questions as we go. Um, ask me to pause or speed up or, or contribute in any way like that. And then also throughout, we're going to throw out a few questions to have you guys answer kind of what you guys are doing at your rural programs because um, I'm excited to share my expertise with you here today, but all of you on the call are also experts yourself. So we like to get as much uh, conversation going in the feedback as possible and have people contribute ideas from their own program. So we're going to use that feedback bar one more time. And we're going to answer the question, what does your agency do? So A, you primarily work with sexual violence survivors. B, you work with domestic violence survivors, C, you work with both, or D, maybe you work at a coalition or you do some sort of other statewide or community work. Okay, so it looks like about two-thirds of us uh, work with both sexual violence and domestic violence work, which, which is great. Um, and then we have a few, I'm going to go with probably coalition staff, or they do community or statewide work. And then just a couple of people work only with sexual violence survivors. Awesome. So we will go to the next screen. So what do you do at your agency? A, you're an advocate or you're doing some sort of direct service work. B, you're a program manager, you're in leadership, you do supervisory work or C, you work at a coalition, or D, you do other things, in which case feel free to type in what it is that you do in the chat box. Okay, so most of us have responded. It looks like we have almost 50% advocates. Um, about a third are supervisory staff. And then we got a couple of people that are coalition staff, and a couple of people said they do other things. 
So it looks like we have a theme coordinator, a volunteer coordinator also on the call. Awesome. So for our last question here at the beginning, where do you live? So feel free to type that into the chat box. Where are you calling in from? So Florida, North Carolina, Minnesota, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Oklahoma. We've really got the Midwest on lockdown. We got them all. Nebraska, Iowa. My coworker Ashley and I were calling in from Iowa. So we're excited to have a few Iowa folks on the call, Wisconsin. Yeah, so it looks like most of us in the central time zone, Louisiana. Awesome. I'm glad we got so many people on the call from so many different places. So our objectives today for this webinar is we're going to spend some time talking about how to recruit volunteers, where to recruit them. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the ways we can set up our volunteer programs to make sure that they're sustainable, um, that we're creatively engaging volunteers so that we make sure that we um, aren't just repeatedly um, over and over training new volunteers and, and having them leave. Um, that, that can feel really exhausting. And then we're going to talk a little bit at the end about how supervision um, can also help create that sustainability of a volunteer program. Let me keep letting me know if the sound cuts in and out, but I will try to do my best. So um, some of the things that programs tell me all over the country are these are kind of the difficulties of setting up a volunteer program. Uh, volunteers aren't always as reliable as paid staff members. You can't necessarily guarantee if they're going to show up for their shift or what it is that you've asked them to do. Uh, they're not always in line with our philosophy. They don't often get as much sort of training and um, expertise in what our philosophy as a sexual assault movement is, and so they, they don't always agree with us on how best to serve survivors. Uh, there's often frequent turnover, especially when we are not able to support them with as many resources and time and training as they would like. Uh, training them and supervising them takes time, just like it takes time with our staff. Uh, they're not always available when centers need them, so sometimes we are really looking for volunteers for really specific hours, uh, and volunteers aren't willing to give their time. Often programs are looking for volunteers to do on-call work, overnights, weekends, and um, a lot of times we get volunteers that don't want to work weekends and things that when we need them. Uh, there's issues with confidentiality. You know, volunteers are also our community members, just like our survivors are, and sometimes we butt up against that. Uh, and then it takes time to make them feel appreciated and supported, and sometimes that feels like an unnecessary task that we shouldn't be taking the time to do. Um, and so that, that feels like it's taking time away from survivors or, or doing the actual work that we have. But these are also the benefits that programs tell me over and over they get from volunteers. So volunteers are able to provide that honest feedback about the way that your center runs and the way the community sees your center um, in a way that the advocates or trained staff members or even board members can't always say. Um, training volunteers about sexual violence even when we Inevitably, whenever we have a, a group of volunteers training with us, not all of them are going to want to volunteer when the, when the training is over. Um, that's just that's the reality of our work is it's just not always cut out for everybody, and people inevitably learn that when they get done being trained. But in the end, you now have more, um, more informed community members that now know more about sexual violence and how it impacts our community. So, while they might not be willing to volunteer for us, um, they might be willing to assist in other ways or at the very least are philosophically supportive of our work and understand more about what our agency does. Um, also having volunteers increases our public awareness and visibility when we only have the ability to hire four or maybe five staff members in a center that's serving 17 counties. We can't have as much of a presence in our community every day, but if we have 20 or 30 volunteers scattered throughout that service area, suddenly our presence can be felt a lot more. 
Uh, volunteers are also able to tackle tasks that we have put on the back burner, or we haven't prioritized in a while. Um, you know, a lot of rural programs don't have the time or capability to have much of a you know, social media presence or to, um, to take a look at their website um, and improve it or decorate the office or start a new initiative. So we keep saying we want to do that. We'll, we'll do that when we have more time, but we often don't find that time. So a lot of times volunteers are the ones that are able to kind of supplement that workload and, uh, and help us get those things done. Volunteers are also able to provide expertise or skills that our staff don't always have. Um, I know I worked at a center that um, just about nobody had any kind of inclination towards um, doing anything sort of artsy. Uh, and so when it was talked about that we would have a support group that would do arts and crafts, nobody really felt confident or capable of doing that. Um, but if we were able to find a volunteer that was maybe an art teacher or, or a local artist that, that could have done that work with us um, and, and been sort of um, a guest presenter or, or a guest advocate at our, at our support group, we could have done um, a lot more. Um, we're able to reach survivors in sort of new pockets of our community. Once again, over and over I hear from rural programs, you know, we, we have really large service areas. Um, I talk with programs all the time that have 17 or 18 counties. So um, how are we able to reach all those survivors? How are we able to provide the response time um, to them that they deserve? So if we're able to get volunteers in some of those most rural pockets of our community, um, then we have the ability to help those survivors. Or uh, if we have no one on staff who um, maybe is, is um, identifies as Latina, then if we're able to get volunteers that are part of the Latino community, suddenly maybe we're reaching other portions of survivors that we weren't getting with our all-white staff. Um, and then in general, it can just sort of reduce our overall workload, so helping share the burden of those on-call hours or those tasks we really want to get done. I'm wondering if anyone wants to share in the chat box now, um, do, do you have a volunteer program kind of already set up and what has the benefit of your volunteer program been? So it looks like nobody's really feeling that chatty, and that's okay. We can move forward, but I'll just leave the question up there in case anyone wants to uh, answer. Um, oh, thank you. Great. Perfect. People are, are sharing a few. So Diane says that volunteers handle their hotline after hours, which is definitely kind of the, the number one thing we hear programs using volunteers for. And Natalie says her program uses volunteers to think. And Samantha says her program has it's allowed um, them to form connections that they don't necessarily already have. And Lindsay says it's helping them connect with college students. That's awesome. So it, it looks like lots of people are sharing. So we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to move forward. Uh, but I'm glad people are sharing. And, and afterwards, we'll probably uh, uh, contribute some sort of supplemental handout that kind of has everyone's contribution from the chat box so we kind of get to hear it all. So the role of a volunteer is different than a paid staff member. Um, a volunteer is someone that's really going to be providing isolated support or accompaniment. They're not going to be able to uh, answer a crisis line and then meet that survivor at the hospital and continue on with them forward the way some of our paid staff members might be able to continue working with that specific survivor and meet all the, the needs and provide them with resources or ongoing counseling that they would like. So we really need to think about that when we're training volunteers and when we're providing them information. Um, they have a different scope of practice. Um, often we're really only training those volunteers for, for specific tasks 
and we should remember, um, you know, if we're if we're an agency that's primarily using our volunteers to answer the crisis line, we probably haven't taught them that much about what court accompaniment might look like or some of the philosophy of the other work that we do at our agency. So we should remember that. Um, confidentiality. Um, some every state has their own laws around the confidentiality of of an advocate, um, and so really you should look into your own state laws to make sure that. Uh, confidentiality of a volunteer advocate is the uh, same or, or find out how it might be different than for a paid staff member. Um, and then boundaries. You know, when we're paid staff members that do this job day in and day out, we, we spend a lot of time living in a rural area thinking about our boundaries and getting, you know, ongoing supervision to talk about how we're going to work through dual relationships. And volunteers often don't get as much time or training on that. So we need to think about what are the boundary issues that they might run into as a volunteer and as a community member? Um, so uh, a lot of times I hear from rural programs that the, the issue that they are running into is that they just don't have enough people that want to volunteer and that it's hard to get people to volunteer in rural areas. Um, so I looked at this uh, survey. It's called Voices of Rural America National Survey Results. Um, it was conducted in, in 2000, um, and 50% of the rural residents, um, they, they did comparisons of rural, urban, and suburban residents, and 50% reported volunteering in the last year, which was the highest percentage uh, among rural, urban, and suburban. Um, and I think something interesting to think about is that 50% that said they had volunteered, but 82% had said that they had helped out a neighbor. So really, it seems like the way that we think about volunteering in a rural community is a little bit different, that we think of it as helping our neighbors, that sort of neighboring concept. So thinking about that as we are advertising our volunteer opportunities and the, the support that we need as an agency as the way to help out your community and a way to help out um, as your neighbors instead of um, the word volunteer kind of has so much uh, behind it that maybe we need to be talking about this as a, a neighboring opportunity instead. So the first thing I suggest programs do is figure out why people want to volunteer. There are so many different reasons. Um, there's the, the personal connection to the issue, the passion. Maybe that person is a survivor themselves or has a family member or knows someone that's a sexual violence survivor. Um, other people just want to help their community. Or um, there can be a, a cultural influence. Um, or an influence of their faith um, to meet new people in the community. I know that when I first moved to a rural community, that was my reason was I didn't really nobody, know anyone, and so I wanted to meet other community members. Um, sometimes people just kind of want to learn a new thing. Um, to gain professional experience, which um, often kind of goes hand in hand with sort of building up your resume. Um, that might even mean people are volunteering with you because eventually they'd like to work at your agency. And we'll talk about that um, in a few slides. Um, it might be a requirement um, for their church or for their school or for a community group that they're involved in that they do so many uh, volunteer hours. Um, and often people just kind of want to feel good at something or to use a skill. Um, so figuring out why people want to volunteer can be really helpful because the way that you might use a volunteer that is, let's say, really wants to um, feel good using a skill that they have, how you might use them as a volunteer might look really different than someone that just is there to meet people. So um, you know, how you might use them if someone's there to kind of meet more community members, it might be great to use them to staff a booth at a community fair because they're going to get to talk with a lot of members of the community and meet lots of people. But someone that was there to, to use a skill that they specifically have might not take much enjoyment out of, of staffing a booth. Um, so that's the first thing that I recommend. As we move forward, kind of recruiting volunteers, uh, these are common places that rural programs have told me they have recruited from. So churches or, or other sort of faith or religious communities, um, schools, uh, colleges, um, community clubs or task forces, um, volunteering teams. So sometimes workplace environments have um, volunteer requirements or um, they want to do a staff bonding project in which they go volunteer somewhere. So they might 
be looking for opportunities to volunteer maybe for eight or 10 or 12 people all at once. Um, volunteering websites like volunteer.com or there's a few other ones. Um, just word of mouth. We know how important that is in a rural community. Uh, community events, uh, job fairs, and then also just kind of if you can get a key community member that just kind of knows a little bit of everybody and is kind of everywhere all the time, if they know about you needing volunteers or maybe they have volunteered for you before, they can really speak to a lot of community members and talk up how great it was to volunteer for your agency um, and recruit others. Um, do the, uh, we'd love, I'd love to use the chat box again and, and find out where all have you recruited volunteers from uh, and, and see what you guys have done in your, your rural community to uh, find volunteers for your program. Especially since it seems like so many of you have some, some really healthy volunteer programs going on working with survivors. So Kelly said word of mouth is number one. I'm not shocked by that. In a rural community, it, it does seem very important. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few slides as well. So past staff members, uh, social media, that's a great one, Catherine. If we have a, a, a good social media presence, that can be a, such a great one. It's a, the hard part is finding the time. Partnering with existing volunteer programs. Uh, that's great. College fairs, local volunteer centers. Wow, you guys have so many ideas. This is great. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on, but please keep feel feel free to add more things in the chat box as we move forward. So I I recommend um, sort of advertising a wide variety of possible tasks for volunteers. Um, like I said, most rural programs really what they do is ask for volunteers to staff that crisis line or to do kind of uh, accompaniment to the hospital or law enforcement um, or shelter potentially uh, at night or on the weekends. And that is a great use of volunteer time. And when we can get the volunteers that want to do that, that's amazing and can be so helpful to alleviate that kind of work burden for our staff members. But unfortunately, that's not always something that everyone that wants to volunteer for your agency feels kind of comfortable, capable of doing. So I think adver advertising a wide variety of tasks can be really helpful. So offering group volunteer opportunities, um, you know, for a lot of times church groups really want to volunteer. Like I said, work groups really want to volunteer. And they want to volunteer in a big clump, like a big group of people. Um, so that can be really helpful, especially for people that are a little bit scared or a little bit nervous about working with survivors or um, kind of entering, entering your services. You know, we have a reputation and it feels scary to some people, so kind of doing it in a big group can feel really helpful. Um, offering direct service opportunities, but also non-direct service opportunities. So, Direct service, you know, like I said, the hospital calls, answering the line. Um, but then also fundraising efforts. That's a non-direct service opportunity that I can imagine every single person on this call says that they would need help with. Um, One-time volunteer, volunteer opportunities, um, you know, for some people they don't really have the time um, or the desire to continuously volunteer several times a month. Uh, frequently what I hear from programs is that there is a um, they, they require their volunteers to agree to volunteer so many times a month or so many times in a set period of time. And for some people, that's really daunting. Um, so being able to have the opportunity to volunteer just once, let's say your shelter really needs painted, um, or other kind of tasks that you really can provide just kind of one at a time. Tasks that don't require transportation or people don't have to go to your center or to go out into the community. So a lot of programs um, struggle with having and maintaining a positive presence on social media. Um, continuously I'm hearing about the best way to be on social media is to be posting every single day. That is a really big time commitment to have to maintain that positive presence. 
So if you have people that don't necessarily want to leave their house or, or have contact with other people or work with other work with survivors, they can be the ones that are continuously updating your Facebook page or your website. And then tasks that don't, um, sorry, tasks that do utilize special skills. So we'll talk about those in a couple more slides, but you know, some of those like support group, holistic healing um, options that people have. So for marketing, um, I always suggest that programs post photos of volunteers on social media. Um, you know, our social media in general works really well when we have a lot of photos. That's kind of what I hear continuously about um, how to maintain a positive social media presence. But obviously we can't put pictures of survivors, so what are we going to put pictures of? Um, pictures of volunteers is a, a great option, especially because some of our volunteers um, really like that public recognition. It makes them feel really good and is part of why they volunteer. And so being able to post pictures of them doing their volunteering work, um, it, it can be a great way to recognize them. It looks like Kelly said, people love it. We take silly photos and post them online in our EU newsletter and have a lot of fun with it. And I love that idea. That's so great. Um, I love that you have a newsletter. That is um, something a lot of rural programs don't really have the capacity to maintain, so that's great. And the silly, uh, silly photos is such a, a great idea. That's totally part of self-care and, and making sure that volunteers feel um, like, the, like the volunteering feels fun and that they're being recognized. So I love that idea. Um, identifying past or current volunteers that are willing to speak to their experience. Um, and that means speak to their experience in a positive way on social media, on your social media, on their social media, um, posting on your website, especially because a lot of times when people are looking for volunteer opportunities, the first place they might look is your website. So if you have a, a page dedicated to um, explanations about what the volunteer opportunities are and a few um, quotes or pictures of volunteers is such a great idea. Um, or even just asking past or current volunteers just to reach out in their private networks, talk to friends, talk to family um, about how they've enjoyed volunteering for you and, and how your agency might be looking for other volunteers. Um, creating a – so, oh, I'm sorry. Ashley said, if we were to post pictures of volunteers, do you have to get their written permission? Uh, yes, that's usually what I say. Um, I, I think that that is best. And if you're looking for a resource for that, I can try to see if, uh, if we can find sort of a template for you and maybe email that out to everybody. Um, creating brochures or flyers, um, just kind of keeping things consistent, having that information available. Because we don't always know when we're going to run into somebody that's that's going to happen to mention that they really want to do something. So being able to provide that written information right away instead of saying, oh, yeah, just check out our website, that can be really helpful. Um, and then creating a job description so volunteers kind of understand what their role within your agency is going to be. It makes them feel really important, and it really clarifies what they're going to be doing. That makes people feel um, more confident to do their job or to do their volunteer role if they know what they're kind of getting into. So marketing continues. So um, taking into account specific communities that you might be trying to target. So I talked to a lot of programs that are really looking for Spanish-speaking volunteers. So if you're putting um, if, if you keep kind of putting your volunteer marketing out into your community, but you're still not really getting any Spanish-speaking volunteers, looking at where are we putting these things? Where, um, where else do we do it? Do we have um, a, a church in, um, or like a, a Catholic church in town that has mass in Spanish? Well, then let's be putting up our, our brochures and our flyers there. Is there a Hispanic grocery store in town? Um, let's see if we can put our flyer up there or brochures there. So thinking about who are we trying to, to target, are there specific kinds of people or skills we're looking for when we're looking for volunteers um, and taking that into account. Assigning one staff member in particular as the contact person, that just really can create some consistency. Um, and your rural grant can support the funds for for a volunteer coordinator position, like a full-time position, if you write that into your rural grant. Um, creating volunteer applications and then kind of distributing them widely. Um, and then 
conducting volunteer interviews. Um, so it, it's so helpful so that you are having a really intentional conversation with people interested in volunteering right at the beginning to find out why is it that you are interested in volunteering? What is it that it makes you so excited to do this? What would make you most satisfied um, in doing this opportunity? And so that people really feel like you're, they're the right fit for you and, and you're the right fit for them. And then uh, another great tactic in recruiting volunteers is to hire volunteers. Um, it really just shows how much you appreciate volunteers and how committed you are to making sure that they are um, awesome, amazing volunteers that have the training and the capability to then go on and work at your agency one day. Um, and it's just a great way to also find dedicated staff members. Um, if you have a really great volunteer who just shows up all the time and really seems to get the philosophy, well, then that's awesome. Now you have someone that can speak highly to other volunteers about their experience and you have a great new dedicated staff member. Um, so Tracy just asked, can we print out this PowerPoint? Yep, when the, when the PowerPoint is over, you're going to be sent a follow-up email that has a copy of the PowerPoint presentation in it. Um, and so you're welcome to distribute that as widely as you would like. So um, maybe before we end that, just, uh, oh no, we'll, we'll move on, sorry. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about creative engagement. So, um, so the, one option for creative engagement is that direct service. Like I said, that is the, the one that I hear over and over again that programs are kind of utilizing the most, but also the ones that programs kind of have the most trouble keeping people um, on board and, and staying volunteers for years to come. So the options for direct service are um, um, operating that crisis and support line, that hotline, and we'll talk um, in a few more slides about ways to help people feel more confident in doing that. Um, a lot of that is going to be some supervision practices and, and talking really heavily about vicarious trauma. But it is a really great option. A number of you have mentioned that's how you use volunteers, and I'm sure it is so helpful for your agency. I know when I had volunteers willing to do that, it was so helpful for me. Um, doing that hospital or law enforcement response, once again, kind of nighttime hours or um, on the weekends. Uh, but then when we're thinking kind of more broadly about how we can use direct service volunteers, having ad, um, volunteers accompany survivors for medical or dental appointments. Um, when we think about comprehensive uh, medical advocacy, a lot of times what we're, our agencies are able to do is that crisis work, right? So accompanying a survivor to the hospital to have evidence collected um, and maybe a follow-up visit. Uh, and, but then we know that there are so many sexual violence survivors who need other kinds of medical services, um, often you know, weeks, months, years, decades after the assault. Um, working with survivors who have been orally assaulted and have been too afraid or nervous um, or triggered to go to dental appointments and they want someone from your agency who is able to accompany them to advocate for them with the dentist and just to not feel alone um, as part of their um, coping uh, plan that they have set up. But oftentimes if it's not an emergency or it's not sort of crisis work, we don't have the staff capacity to be able to do that kind of um, really amazing medical advocacy support. So if we're able to use volunteers um, that have the free time to be able to do some of that supplemental kind of comprehensive work, um, that's amazing. Uh, having civil or criminal justice accompaniments, um, accompanying survivors to courthouse or other things, once again that, that crisis work, that kind of initial um, necessary work, but also um, things that kind of might be tangentially uh, related to their work that we don't always have the time to to do. And then leading or oftentimes sugge I suggest co-facilitating a support group with a paid staff member, uh, especially if the way that you're using that volunteer is because they have a, a specific special skill. They might have gone to training um, to be an advocate and have that expertise also, uh, but a lot of times it can be really helpful to have a, a staff member there as well. 
Um, a few more direct service options would be transportation assistance. Once again, we, it's one of those things we often don't always have time to do, especially if the um, thing that they need to get to or from is something that we're not going to be helping them do. Um, or something they don't necessarily need someone to accompany them to, that they feel um, empowered and confident to be able to go to that appointment on their own, but they just don't have the transportation available. Assisting in, in helping survivors make phone calls or online searches. Once again, some of that work that isn't really crisis work that we usually reserve for just staff members to do that crisis work. Um, but we know survivors need help doing, um, or sometimes they just need the use of a phone or a computer, um, or, or they don't know how to do online searches for the resources that they need in your community. Um, so assisting them with finding those local resources. Um, and then uh, language assistance. So if we're really needing survivor, or I'm sorry, volunteers who can answer the crisis line um, in another language or who um, can do that accompaniment work um, and, and speak the survivor's first language can just be so helpful. Um, and then kind of moving forward, we're going to talk about things that people often don't always think of as something a volunteer can do because we really reserve a lot of um, our volunteer work for that direct service on call work, but there's so many other things that people can do to assist survivors and assist your agency, um, and, and especially for volunteers that are, are too nervous, too scared, um, or maybe they were recently assaulted and they don't want to be triggered by doing direct service work, or community members that due to their schedule just don't have the ability to do that kind of on call work, but they really want to help your agency. So uh, filing or organizing uh, a filing system, let's be real, none of us ever have time for that. <laughs> so finding someone who is, um, I know that's something I would do in a heartbeat as a volunteer is I love organizing things and creating those systems. So that would be so fun for me to get to do, and I am sure there's someone in your community that would find that task so exciting. <laughs> Ashley, I will, I will make, try to make it down there someday and help you out. Um, doing some of that data entry, once again, it's those tasks we often don't find the time to do ourselves, but we know at the last minute we're scrambling um, to, to get that stuff together before we have to turn in a grant. So if we have a volunteer that um, I know my boss would geek out over doing data entry, she kind of loves that stuff. Um, we're a bunch of nerds here at the Resource Sharing Project. So she would love to get to do that kind of stuff um, and is so helpful for our agency. Um, once again, sort of organizing craft art supplies or training materials, or we all know that our shelters are overflowing with clothing and toiletries and so disorganized in chaos. Um, because we never have the time to, to spend time organizing. And there are, um, that would be a great activity for a church group or a, or a work group to come in and kind of spend the day organizing some of our closets and things. And it would be just so helpful for us. Um, someone who would be really excited to um, research or create um, a resource list or a referral list. Um, w once again, that can be so helpful for survivors a lot of times we aren't able to do that work um, where we can accompany survivors to all the places we want to accompany them, but we can create a list of um, doctors or um, professionals or therapists in our area that are trauma-informed or that we know we have positive relationships with, and so we know they would work well with sexual assault survivors, so we can kind of compile those lists and, and have them ready to go uh, for survivors to utilize, and that makes our lives so much easier, and we don't always have the time to do that kind of work. Assist with our social media efforts, especially if you have some uh, teens knocking down your door that really want to do some work. Um, that would be a, I, they would just, you know, flourish at that. That is not something that I would do well, um, but I am sure there are teens or young adults in your community that would just do that amazingly uh, and so quickly. Um, and would love it. <laughs> um, and then research new concepts for service delivery. That often is an item that gets pushed to the very bottom of our list, is researching new ways to work with survivors or reading a new study that shows um, no, more trauma-informed ways to do this or that. Um, you know, we have so many resources at the Resource Sharing Project. It's kind of where we got our name. 
and we love sharing those. Um, but oftentimes I know rural programs don't have the time to do that. So if you have um, a volunteer uh, um, that wants to kind of read some of those papers and, and highlight some of the things that they thought your agency could really benefit from or um, type up something, uh, report back on the different um, resources that they found, uh, that would be so helpful to our agency and, and we just don't have time for that always. Um, awareness. So uh, especially helpful for SAM, uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, helping to, to plan, organize, promote, and attend fundraising events. We never have time to fundraise, right? And we often don't have the ability with our grants to do much of that work ourselves. And so if we have volunteers that are willing to do that or have expertise doing that, that can be really helpful. So Jill asked, any best practices for making sure volunteers represent the agency, the mission, the message professionally and consistently on social media? So there's not any resources that I know of, although I'm definitely going to write that question down because that would be an amazing publication that we could do a one or two sheeter on that would be so helpful. Um, so I'm definitely going to write that down. Please, anyone else, um, feel free to contribute now how you've kind of worked around that, that would be, um, feel free to, we, that's what we love about the conversation is I might not have that expertise that some of you might, and I will do some research after this um, and email you, Jill, or anyone else that kind of wants that information. Because that's a great question. That can be hard. Um, staffing booths at fairs or community events, um, or like I said, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, is so helpful to our outreach, um, especially for, um, like I said, when we have rural programs that have 17, 18 counties. That is a lot of community fairs. That is a lot of county-wide events that we cannot possibly always attend. Um, and so just having someone go, I've even found it beneficial when people just go to attend the event and they don't set up a booth or anything, but they wear an agency t-shirt. Um, and it makes your agency feel like it's represented there and that people understand, especially when we kind of have that main office maybe is two or three counties away. Um, people don't always feel that presence that your agency exists in some of those outer, outer service area, outer counties. And so just having people go and be is so helpful. And then engaging with that community education or any kind of prevention work um, is, is really helpful. Um, so for utilizing special skills or interests that people have, um, that is so helpful for that kind of holistic healing um, that we have. So a lot of this is going to be for classes or support groups. So organizing support groups around um, art or organizing support groups around music or exercise and movement can be so helpful. But even if it isn't meant to be a support group, um, especially if maybe you want that volunteer to be able to run the class themselves and not have a direct service paid staff member also do it with them, they might be able to just lead a class on, how to, on cooking, really basic principles. Um, we know for holistic healing that you know, trauma happens to all five of our senses, and so all five of our senses need to be present when we're doing that healing work. So that means listening and looking and tasting, all of those things, smelling, all need to be included in our work. Um, maybe you have someone in your community that is an, a really uh, amazing gardener and wants to come help a garden, um, create a garden in, in your um, agency's backyard and have survivors come help them do it. They don't necessarily need um, to have all the expertise that a direct service advocate would. They really just need to bring their gardening skills and their enthusiasm for the work. So talking about volunteer sustainability. Um, this was another sur uh, survey that I looked at called Volunteer Satisfaction and Volunteer Action. Um, that was conducted in 2008. And what this survey found uh, was that volunteers reported greater satisfaction when the opportunities they were given while they were volunteering matched the reason that they came to volunteer. So that's why we talked about in the slide all the way at the beginning, figuring out what it is 
um, especially if you are able to have the time to do volunteer interviews, having a really intentional conversation about why is it that you are so excited to come volunteer for us, what, it is, what is it that brought you here, um, and figuring out ways to meet those needs. And there was an increased amount of time devoted to volunteering when the volunteers felt satisfied. So that is more hours working for you, the more you can make a, feel, a volunteer feel satisfied with the work that they have done. So how do we make volunteers feel satisfied with their work? Be prepared for them. I can't tell you how many times um, you know, I have uh, been a volunteer myself and I walk in and they're like, oh, uh, yeah, I think maybe we were expecting somebody today. Let me go figure it out. And it's like they're scrambling in the background to figure out what to do because I actually came in to do volunteer work. And it's like they, they clearly didn't give any thought before I came in about what they were going to have me do or, or what was going to be there for me. So they're kind of scrambling at the last minute. So be prepared for them. Make the volunteers feel welcome and that their work is necessary. Don't just kind of be like, oh, uh, I guess maybe shred all this stuff. I can't think of anything else to do. You know, make their work feel necessary. Um, and, and provide volunteers with interesting work. Um, it's, it's a lot like having interns at your agency. Um, some amount of the things that you're going to ask them to do might be some what we call grunt work or not that fun or not exactly what they ask be able to do, but it definitely shouldn't be the bulk of what they're doing for your agency. Match volunteers to the correct role, so you know, finding out what made them excited to volunteer, and then being able to provide them further training or information so that they feel capable of doing that job. Make them feel confident in what they're doing. Uh, nine times out of ten when you call a volunteer, um, to ask them, you know, why is it that you stopped volunteering for us, it's almost always that they didn't feel like they were doing the job well enough. That especially is true when you're doing direct service work. Um, not as much time orienting you to the work or training you to the work happens when you're a volunteer, and so it's like suddenly somebody puts a phone in your hand and is like, good luck, see you in 12 hours. That's really scary. So making sure that they really feel like they feel comfortable doing the work and that you have given them all the information that they need to be able to do that well. So Ashley says, what if you get a bad vibe from someone that is wanting to volunteer? Like the person says, I only want to work with women, no men. That's a really great question, Ashley, and, and I would really love if anyone else wants to contribute kind of how they have worked around that. But that's part of why I think the the um, volunteer interview works so well so that you can find out and talk to them about, you know, is this really the right work for them? And if you are getting, quote, that kind of, quote, bad vibe from them, maybe you want to make sure that they aren't doing direct service work, but you can find other work available for them. Um, if, that, if what they're really wanting to do is volunteer work, then it might be that you have to have a hard conversation with them, letting them know that, um, there's this really specific philosophy that your agency is working from, uh, and if they kind of can't work from that philosophy as well, that that it's not really the right fit for them. Sometimes I have been working with volunteers that I haven't really been able to even figure that out until they've gone on a few hospital calls um, or have worked on the hotline a few times and uh, and. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but that's part of supervision is having those conversations about, so how did last night go? You got your first couple of calls. How'd that go? What, what were some issues you were working through? And be able to have those conversations with them and reframe for them. Because a lot of times, um, you know, I've worked with people that even people that are advocates that are going to be doing this work paid come in with misconceptions about sexual violence. You know, we're all steeped in it every day. I mean, even advocates that really do have the philosophy that we have, we sometimes get tired and burnt out, and we start to think bad things about survivors too. And so we have our coworkers and we have our supervisors that we can go to to say, oh, I'm just getting really tired of this survivor, and I know I shouldn't feel this way, so I need you to reframe this for me. And we know that volunteers feel that way too. So being able to provide them th that training and that reframe that we can work around. And then you've just created a more informed community member. 
which is awesome. It looks like Teresa um, responded kind of similarly, you know, uh, starting to, to interview volunteers, so that's awesome. So volunteer satisfaction continued, so really having frequent and intentional communication, making sure they understand um, how long their task is going to take um, or kind of what is necessary to do whatever the job is that you've asked them to do, uh, and then creating that environment that encourages feedback. Nothing feels worse than being given a task and then you're not really sure how to do it and you're not sure who to ask for help and you're scared if you ask for help that you'll get in trouble or that they aren't going to be excited to have you back. Like that doesn't feel good at all. So making sure that volunteers feel comfortable um, coming to you with questions and continuing to just have that open dialogue back and forth. Um, allowing volunteers to assist in the planning of that work and not just do the grunt work. So, you know, creating a SAM event might be a great example. Having volunteers come in to talk about um, the, the SAM work that you're going to do, the Sexual Assault Awareness Month work that you're going to do, and be involved in the planning of some of that work instead of planning all of it, doing all this fun stuff, having the great conversations about the reason you're doing this work, and um, all of that, and then just having them come in and make some photocopies or something. That, that feels like the grunt work that, that um, we can ask them to do, but only if we're also allowing them to be in a part of the planning as well. So um, we'll move on to, to making volunteers feel appreciated. So providing volunteers recommendations for jobs or for school, um, really showing that you care about why it is that they came in to volunteer um, and giving them positive feedback when it's necessary and, and when they ask for it. Um, providing the opportunity for promotions, such as a, a lead volunteer, um, can be really fun, especially if someone has been with you for a number of years and has a lot of expertise to share. That relieves some of the burden from you. Um, they can ask more of their questions to the lead volunteer. The lead volunteer can kind of do some of that orientation work that you have when you have a, a new volunteer or maybe can sit in on, on some of those volunteer interviews that you're having. Um, and it makes them feel really good that you recognize the great work that they have been doing and that you appreciate their expertise and the time that they have committed to your agency. Um, providing a, a designated time that you have set aside for volunteer recognition, such as an annual dinner or an event like that where you're providing volunteers a, a set time where you're going to say, this is what we love about you, here's a certificate, or um, here's a present from our agency, or just here's public recognition that you've been doing amazing work and we see you, your work is seen and appreciated. Um, it keeps people coming back and wanting to do more and speak positively to their friends, their family, their neighbors about working for your agency or, or volunteering for your agency. Um, or uh, other, other programs I've talked to have considered giving like job titles other than volunteer that might recognize the work that they do, especially if you have volunteers that are doing a lot of work for you, that are dedicating a really significant portion of their personal time to working with your agency, maybe volunteer feels um, not quite right for what they've been doing for your agency and something else could feel um, a little bit more appropriate or um, honor the work that they've been doing a little bit better. Uh, regularly providing recognition for individual volunteer efforts. So not just that annual dinner once a year you're recognizing volunteers, but that um, you're continuously doing that. Ways that I have done that or I've heard other agencies do that is by providing volunteers with food um, or little treats, gifts, cards, handwritten notes. Um, you know, a lot of agencies say we just don't have the money to do that, and that's fine. It doesn't take a lot of money to make someone feel appreciated. A handwritten note goes so far, especially if it comes from a really genuine place where you can really say, this is what I have recognized that is so amazing about the work that you have been able to do for our agency, and we really appreciate you. Uh, I worked for an agency that had someone pretty artistic on staff, a uh, different agency, and, um, and we had a staff member who 
uh, just spent like five minutes on each one and just did like a cute little caricature doodle of each, like a little hand drawing for each volunteer. And that took like no money at all and a pretty short amount of time. And those volunteers loved it. They felt so appreciated and seen, and that was so helpful. Uh, remembering volunteer birthdays or big events like their anniversary with the agency, um, recognizing the, that they have been there for two years or um, whatever, however long it has been that they have been with the agency. Um, and then taking advantage of opportunities to recognize volunteer efforts at community events. So some of more of that public recognition. Certainly finding out, once again in that interview, um, you know, how do you like to be recognized? Because there's lots of people that would really hate to be publicly recognized. Um, and they would prefer that kind of handwritten private note that they can keep. And other people would really appreciate to be recognized in more public ways, like on your Facebook page or at a community event. So part of that volunteer interview can be um, just like in the ways that we ask our staff members, how do you like to be appreciated? How do you like to be recognized for your work? Including some, some questions like that. Um, and then I'm wondering if in the chat box you guys want to add what has your organization done to make volunteers feel appreciated. So include that in the chat box because I've been loving your guys' contributions so far. You guys have been saying really amazing things. Oh, Kelly has a volunteer of the year, which I really love. I'm sure that's really hard to pick. And Christy does a volunteer appreciation lunch. I love it. Food is always a really great motivator. <laughs> Oh, Catherine sends out Valentine's to volunteers, which is really sweet. I really like that. That's awesome. I'm really loving it. We're going we're gonna to move forward. Like I said, we got a lot to cover, and I want to make sure there's time for questions at the end. But feel free to keep, keep uh, adding on as we move forward. So volunteer sustainability. The number one way that you can do that is training. So um, providing an orientation to new volunteers, much like the orientations that we should be having with our new staff members, um, making sure that even if they, these are volunteers that won't be doing direct service, that volunteers should still be getting a tour of the whole building or the facilities, um, understand more about the organization and all the work that is done there, um, and information of kind of how their work, even if it's not direct service work, is positively impacting our larger movement um, against sexual violence always makes people feel necessary and important. Um, a, this kind of is almost more important when you have staff members that aren't doing direct service work because the direct service staff members, or, or I'm sorry, volunteers, can really kind of see often on a daily basis how their work might be impacting survivors positively. But those that might be organizing your filing system or doing data entry don't really know how what they're doing is so incredibly important, and if they weren't doing it, would make your um, would really put a great burden on the agency. Um, so being able to provide that larger context, and then of course providing volu um, I'm sorry volunteer training on actual direct service uh, needs and, and advocacy skills, um, uh, providing context to the work that they'll be doing for the for the agency. So just providing some history of the movement so people understand that. Offering ongoing staff support so volunteers don't feel so alone. A lot of times we're having staff, um, just like we as staff members in rural areas often feel really isolated and alone because we only have two, three, four employees at an agency that's serving, you know, seven, eight, nine counties. We don't get to see our coworkers that much. We feel really isolated. We spend more time in the courthouse than we do at our desks near our coworkers. So uh, volunteers feel just as isolated, if not more so. Um, they often don't get to meet other volunteers. They often don't even really get to meet other staff members. They're usually doing work outside of work time for us. Um, so making sure that they feel that connection with the agency and with another human being that knows this work 
Um, so like I said, you know, one approach is to have a staff member dedicated to working with volunteers. That often can really only work if you have the funds to fund someone specifically to kind of head up your volunteer program. So the other option is kind of um, splitting that work up among all your coworkers and assigning a different staff member to each volunteer or to a few volunteers so that that volunteer knows this is who I contact, this is who I ask questions to, um, and maybe this is the person that's responsible for making sure I feel appreciated or, or writing me that Valentine or uh, inviting me to that lunch so that there's that um, really personal connection to the agency. Um, bringing current volunteers into any kind of training that you have that, to speak to the work that they have done, um, kind of that lead volunteer mentality again, uh, but also just making sure that people feel like, oh, there's other people in this community that have done this work, and um, those volunteers can provide some expertise because the role of a volunteer, like we said, is a little different than a staff member. So they can really speak um, with much more authenticity to what volunteering is going to be like than some of our staff members can. Um, providing them materials that they can keep for future reference. Um, once again, we just often don't do that kind of work even for staff members, let alone volunteers, and they just don't have as much of a connection to our agency. So being able to, to have materials that they can keep referring to if they're on the crisis line or they're at a community event. Um, maybe that's, a, that's kind of a, a material that you can provide, like Jill was suggesting about um, social media. Um, providing that continued education, so a lot of times we have volunteers that get that initial volunteer advocacy skill training and we don't provide them um, educa continued education opportunities the way that we do for our paid staff members. So we might have an advocate that's volunteering for us for four or five years and they haven't gone through another training um, in a long time and they're going to feel rusty and they're not going to have the newest information about our work. So being able to provide that continued education is, is really crucial. And then providing information on policies about when it's necessary or even at your agency possibly required to seek support from um, the super, whatever, in whatever way your, your organization um, has a volunteer supervisor or supervisors. So some agencies I've talked to have made it kind of mandatory that if you are a volunteer that actually gets called out when you're on call and you go to the hospital, um, that you're required to within 24 hours kind of touch base with someone from the agency to just talk through that. One, that really ensures that um, volunteers have the ability to ask questions, um, to clarify the work that they provided, that um, they can get support for any kind of vicarious trauma they might be experiencing, and it's a way for us to ensure the quality of the services we're providing survivors and that volunteers can kind of check in and make sure we don't have any of those volunteers like that you guys have said that we're feeling kind of bad vibes about, that we can reframe that work for them and maybe provide them with more education on a particular topic they might be struggling with, just like we all sometimes struggle. So Rachel said, Leah, can I get a copy of this PowerPoint and transcript you want to share with your other volunteer coordinator? Yay, we love to hear that. Please share with as many people as possible. At the end of this, power, um, at the end of this webinar at 3.30, we're going to be sending you a follow-up email which will include a copy of this um, PowerPoint, and I will also be including a recording of this webinar. Please let me know if maybe, I, I know you said a transcript, but um, we'll, we'll be doing a, you guys have had so many great ideas, we will be doing some sort of handout with all of the chat box questions, so maybe that's what you mean by transcript, um, or if you have someone that is deaf or hard of hearing that needs um, a copy of this PowerPoint, please email me separately and we will try to find a way to, to get that to them. So we'll move forward with supervision. I want to leave you guys time for questions at the end, um, although you've been really good at asking them in the moment. Um, but supervision is really key to keeping um, that sustainable volunteer program. So um, assigning someone the task of overseeing volunteers or in some capacity, maybe you really need to spread that out among multiple people, but making sure that you're providing enough information to the 
staff member or staff members that are going to be doing the overseeing volunteer coordination. Creating a comfortable environment and communicating regularly. We definitely don't want any volunteers that um, that are just um, that are only checking in every few months. You know, we should be contacting them and making sure that we're talking to them on a really regular basis about the work that they're doing, giving them positive feedback, um, checking in about vicarious trauma, letting them ask questions. We don't ever want to go. Um, you know, weeks and weeks or months without being able to talk to a volunteer. Uh, regularly scheduling evaluations where we can offer praise or answer questions, offer support. Um, that is a positive for volunteers and then also, like I said, really keeps our service standards up um, and provides us the opportunity to figure out why is it maybe that volunteers aren't wanting to stay with our agency um, or why are we losing volunteers? And asking volunteers questions about, you know, do you have thoughts on where we should be advertising for volunteers or ways that we could be making you feel more appreciated? Um, often that's the first thing I tell programs if they feel like their volunteer program isn't a success is, are you asking the volunteers what they want out of their volunteering experience? Are you asking them for feedback on how your agency has supported them? And then regularly communicating the importance of self-care and, and making it a consistent topic in your supervision. Um, that is something that we all need to be spend a lot of time doing for our paid staff members, um, and in some ways just even more so with volunteers, even though they might have less frequent communication with volunteers, or some of them might have no contact with volunteers, um, they're still feeling um, and, and thinking about sexual violence on a regular basis just because they're doing volunteer work with our agency. And just like it's important for coalition staff members that aren't doing direct service to um, you know, care for themselves, it's important for volunteers or staff members that aren't doing direct service to also still care for ourselves. Um, schedule reoccurring group meetings for volunteers. So um, in addition to that kind of one-on-one -on -one supervision that we were just talking about, it can also be really helpful to provide group experiences to spend time talking about volunteering. It provides the opportunity for volunteers to socialize and get to know each other. Once again, to not feel like you're volunteering in a vacuum and there's nobody else doing work like you. Um, and for those volunteers that said they want to meet people, that that's kind of their motivation for volunteering is to, to meet community members and, and have more of a social life, being able to um, meet other people doing work like them. Providing that opportunity for continued education. So maybe that group meeting will have a continued ed component, component and sort of like a fun component to it as well. Um, you're going to be bringing in a variety of perspectives and information, and um, sometimes that's when those tricky um, parts of our work come out is in those conversations. A lot of times volunteers kind of feel like they're supposed to say what, what we ask them to, but then when you get multiple people in a room, maybe um, some of those bad vibes might be um, able to be kind of shared in the light a little bit more, and that could be a great time to address some of those tricky points of our work together in a room to make volunteers not feel so alone with this work and just provide an opportunity for that self-care. Once again, we just got to make sure that we're making volunteers feel the importance of caring for themselves um, and that we model that for them as well by providing those opportunities. Um, consider a tiered volunteer program or trial period. So I've, I've talked to a couple programs that have done something like this. So it, you, it allows you kind of a set time frame to evaluate that work. Um, maybe it's you volunteer for two months and then you're evaluated and then you, are, uh, you volunteer for six more months and then you're evaluated and then after that you get an evaluation every year or something like that. And it's kind of building in that structure right away, um, that organizational structure to check in um, and provide that time for appreciation and gratitude and also to check in about the work they've been doing. Uh, it ensures plenty of time for supervision before direct services start because a lot of volunteers, especially if they're doing direct service work, feel really uh, uncomfortable or nervous or scared that they're going to say the wrong thing, they're going to do the wrong thing, that they're going to make this somehow worse for survivors. 
Um, so easing them in and not just kind of handing them a phone and walking away uh, can really help them do better work and feel more confident doing that work. Uh, and it ensures a buy-in from volunteers. Um, they're able to access uh, survivors and their personal information. Uh, that can be really helpful asking volunteers to maybe do some of the um, non-direct service work for so many months before we allow them the opportunity to do some direct service work. Once again, providing us the opportunity to give them much, as much kind of one-on-one -on -one time with our supervisors and training before we're giving them this really personal information and, and access to survivors in our community. Um, survivors as volunteers, this comes up a lot, um, and we I think only have one, two, looks like two slides on it. So if you want to talk about this more in depth, please email me. Let's have a, a more in depth conversation about this, but this typically comes up every time. Um, volunteers sometimes are survivors, whether they disclose their survivorship to your agency or not. Um, we don't always know who is a survivor in the room. Um, survivors are not inherently more susceptible to vicarious trauma. And in fact, sometimes um, the, the data is kind of split on this, that survivors um, have created their own coping mechanisms that sometimes make it even easier um, for them to deal with vicarious trauma than, um, than volunteers that are not survivors or than staff members that are not survivors. Um, and this work can be a really important um, opportunity for survivors to, to heal, to give back to their community, to um, give them a, a new purpose. Um, so I, I would not shy away from um, having survivors be volunteers at your agency. Um, that's kind of almost the only amount of time we really have to talk about that. But like I said, if you want to talk more in depth, please email me. Let's, let's set up a call and have a conversation about that. I will say if you are going to have survivors as volunteers, that open communication is really important. Creating that emotional safe space so that all volunteers are able to speak about their experiences and how their experiences kind of relate to this work. Um, and that we set up trigger plans and, and self-care plans um, for them with them to make sure that they're capable of doing that work in the best way they possibly can. Karen said, while we're training, the volunteers, while we are training the volunteers, can we count those hours as volunteer hours or do we have to wait until they are actually doing the volunteer work? Um, I agree with Ashley. That's a really good question. I'm wondering if you're referring specifically to like your grant report or what you mean by count the hours as volunteer hours. Um, and maybe we can chat off of this call and make sure. Um, Karen, let's check in about this after. Um, and Ashley, if you want to send me an email about that too, that's great. Uh, but I don't think we have time right now to address that. Um, but let's chat after this about that a little bit more. Uh, so self-care, providing self-care activities for volunteers and staff is, staff is really important. Uh, it just, you know, providing those activities for volunteers really reinforces your center's commitment to self-care. It provides the opportunity for staff members and volunteers to get to know each other. Like I said, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Volunteers kind of come in, do the work at night or whatever, um, and don't really have, you know, can't put a face to a name, uh, don't know who anyone is. Um, and so they're not going to feel comfortable coming forward to ask for support or assistance or to talk through one of those um, tricky points in our work if they don't feel comfortable and and have met people and feel like they can trust them. Um, and it makes volunteers feel appreciated. Um, I'm wondering uh, if anyone wants to share what, what does your center do together for self-care? So Tracy said they have staff retreats, and I'm assuming you invite volunteers to those is um, why you mentioned that. Um, Ashley says a lot of cigarette breaks, which I agree does tend to uh, bond people even if it's not so good for you. 
Um, and Diane also does a lot of office, out of office retreats, which I love. If we're able to find uh, the the grant funds to support that work, that's so great. Um, we'll move forward because we're getting close to end of time, but please feel free to keep sharing as you uh, have the time to type more things in there. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is just evaluation. So um, I just want to kind of put this up as a reminder that we always need to be evaluating how effectively our center is utilizing volunteers on a on a regular basis. It's just the most consistent way to make sure we're meeting we're meeting the needs of survivors. Uh, we're meeting the desires of volunteers and that we're doing the best work we can. Um, getting feedback from current and past volunteers. Um, if you have the ability to set up an exit interview type situation, just like when staff leave, that we're interviewing volunteers when they would like to stop their um, volunteer opportunities with you to find out, why is that? Is there anything we could have done better? Can you provide this with um, just some, some really great information on what we could be doing better to recruit volunteers or to make them feel appreciated or to kind of just sustain that volunteer program. And just don't try, uh, don't be afraid to try new ways of utilizing and supporting volunteers. I think it can feel really daunting, um, but when you kind of put that, all that work in at the front end, um, it really leads to um, a lot of burden being lifted off of all of you um, with all the work that you're doing when you're able to kind of creatively utilize volunteers, even if it's not something that you have done uh, in the past. Um, I'm going to just skip past these real quick because, like I said, they'll be listed. These references will be listed on the printout that you will be receiving in your email when this is over. Um, and then I just kind of want to go through some, some questions. You guys, like I said, have been asking a lot of questions. I see a couple right now that we can look through. Um, but are there any questions that you want to uh, address now? So Jill asked about, and, and this is honestly a question I feel like we get all the time, which is um, regarding survivors as volunteers, we've occasionally considered mandating a period of time after they have received services for them to apply to volunteer, yet every survivor is different. On the flip side, we've noticed that survivors to whom the experience is very fresh sometimes have more trouble with boundaries. Does anyone else have a time requirement? So feel free to... Um, to respond to Jill's question, um, we typically don't recommend that there is a time period required because exactly the way that you put it, every survivor is different. So I feel like that is a great question to be adding in to your volunteer interview process is talking through um, if you feel comfortable sharing, do you have experience with, with sexual violence in your past and how do you think that's going to impact the work that you're doing and just having some really honest conversations with volunteers because like you said, everyone is going to be different. And so having that um, mandatory period afterwards really sets up this idea that there is a set healing time that after so many weeks or months after your sexual violence that you'll be totally capable of doing that. And we've, I've worked with volunteers that um, you know, they, it's been past the mandatory waiting period and they're still not over, they're still not capable of doing that direct service work and they've known that and we've been able to have conversations about that and so that's worked out well that we were able to have those honest conversations but the mandatory waiting period was never going to fix that. Only a, a conversation with them was going to help us get there. I'm glad it looks like lots of you are responding to Jill's question. Um, and I love the cool down room. Sounds very cool. And I feel like we should have that for all of, all of us, for advocates too. Um, that's great. So uh, please feel free to keep asking questions. We have 10 more minutes. Um, but I will uh, just let you know, you know, thank you to OBW for you know, um, funding our grant project. Um, and, and allowing us to, to bring this webinar to all of you. 
Um, we have other upcoming webinars. The next one that we have is about remote supervision in dual multi-service advocacy agencies. It's based on a paper that we wrote and published recently in the rural um, uh, in our rural TA, and just talks a lot about. Um, definitely, supervisors are welcome to that to talk about how we supervise employees that are doing remote advocacy that sometimes we don't get to see uh, every day. But also for coworkers to help them feel connected to the employees that are working in outreach offices or doing mobile advocacy. So I encourage all of you to sign up for that. Um, and thank you all of you for attending. You have given so much exciting information and, and were lovely. So um, please email me, call me, um, get on our rural listserv so that we can keep talking about this and, and keep having these conversations. So I will put it back on the question slide. Um, and any other questions that kind of come forward, we can, we can get to in the next uh, five minutes or so that we have left. Well, thank you, Ashley. I'm glad the, the webinar was great. Um, your contributions were great as well. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Diane. I'm so glad you guys were able to come and we could have this conversation. Um, it looks like there's not really any other questions kind of coming through, so uh, I rushed through all of that and so we're able to kind of quit a few minutes early. Um, thanks, everybody. And like I said, we'll, um, there'll be um, a SurveyMonkey link app when, you, when I close this webinar for you to provide some feedback for how the webinar went, and then you'll be receiving some follow-up resources and information um, in the next day or two. So thanks, everybody.